Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Big East Rewind. I am Chuck Everson, your seven-foot host from Villanova University, and my partner, as always, the great doctor, Dr. Sonny Sparrow. How are you, Sonny? Chuck, I'm really excited for a lot of reasons. Got another Hall of Famer. Well, you, you should be nervous. Because we got two more, two well, big, <laughs> and yeah. and and he's the, a Hoya. You should the deck, be nervous. The deck is stacked. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> should be nervous, Sonny. You know you're I excited. I get it, but you know I already got fouled twice I when I sat down. Man, listen, we let let bygones be bygones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but we have a thing, so and I, you know, I'll get into that with you in a second with the bigs and the guards. So uh, we go back and forth, and we had we had some of your brothers on. We had Patrick on. We had Ralph Dalton on. Right. So it's, if you notice, they're all people of size. Yeah. So, uh, Sonny got a little intimidated, so we'll, we'll <laughs> see about that. So well, you have to worry about me. I'm sitting down. So, <laughs> yeah. Without any further ado, yeah. our guest today, a basketball Hall of Famer, Sonny, another Hall of Famer yep. on the show. This guy was a 2006 NBA champion with the Miami Heat, a 2000 gold medalist. Uh, in the Olympics, Olympic gold medalist, and he's now the Miami Heat vice president, player of player development and programs. The great Hoya legend Alonzo Morning is joining us. Thanks for coming in, Zo. Uh, thanks for having me, gentlemen. Great to yeah. have you. So, as we were starting to say, you know, we we do this thing back and forth about the guards and 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 the bigs especially when it comes to uh coaching and stuff you know yeah. i get a little offended right. when all these point guards are getting the jobs right you know and uh patrick and i double teamed them pretty good when pat was on we right. i had you've never seen patrick laugh like this in a in a uh in an interview before you know how stoic he is you know yeah, you've yeah, been yeah, around him a lot he's very yeah. straight laced well, he jumped oh, right oh, in no, and he, went after Sonny. He's softened up in his old age, man. He's, <laughs> he has. He has. He's so, softened up uh, quite a bit. Now. I like it. I like this Patrick a lot better. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a little different, Um, but we, we had a lot of fun with him. So, uh, a little more and family with, uh, friendly now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to have a lot of fun with you, too. So I appreciate you coming in and you're spending your time with us, you know? Yeah, no problem. So, so talk about where you get started. You're in, you're in Virginia. You come out. You're the number one player in the, in high school coming out of Virginia. Right. Talk about your recruitment process and how you got to the hilltop. Well, the recruitment process was a dream for a kid receiving all that attention, man, from every college in the country. You know, the only thing that. Um, that we didn't have, we didn't have social media and we didn't have the technology. So if we had all of that back then, it would have been insane. It really would have, you know, because uh, it, it wasn't a day that went by where I didn't get letters and packages coming to the house, man. And, and uh, it, it was, it was crazy. It was like Christmas every day for me, you know, and I was getting sneakers and letters and, you know, packages and everything, you know, so. The long and short of it is, is that, you know, back then, um, you know, I had a tough decision to make. Um, and um, I had, had a great coach, my high school coach, Bill Lasseter, you know, who was who was also coached by the Hall of Famer John B. McClendon. Okay. Who John B. McClendon is in the Hall of Fame, uh, and he coached uh, next to – uh, James Naismith. So, wow. <laughs> so, so I was, I was fortunate enough to have a coach, you know, that had the influence of, you know, some pioneers of basketball. You know, he instilled a great deal of knowledge in me, you know, especially from a defense defensive pers perspective. You know, which is why in high school, you know, I averaged a triple double because. You know, I, I made it an, an inserted, a concerted effort to to go after shots and block shots, you know. So that was really a big part of my game. And that was my MO. Yeah, I could put the ball in the basket. I could run the floor and everything, you know. But I really did a lot to protect uh, the basket and to help my teammates defensively. So who was in the uh... – who was in the sweepstakes? Like, who was your final grouping of coaches and and or programs, and why? Well, the, the final grouping was um, T 
two Big East and three ACC. You know, Maryland, Georgia Tech, Virginia. Okay. Syracuse and Georgetown. I thought Syracuse was there. I did. Yeah, yeah so I went on my visits, and um, they were incredible visits. I, I, do you know what? The, the probably out of all the visits, the most boring visit was probably Georgetown's. <laughs> really? Everybody else's visit was a lot of fun, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, statue of limitations is up. Anything you want to share, we're good. Yeah, Go hey, no, I'm not going to reveal everything. I just had a good time. Trust me. Well, <laughs> I tell you something, Zoe. You mentioned visits in Syracuse. Sonny was my host when yeah. I visited Syracuse. Oh, really? He was. So I turned around. Le he did such a good job, Zoe. I left him and signed with the little Italian guy over at Villanova, you know? Yeah, so okay. He made a pretty good decision. We yeah, did all right, okay. you know? We did like okay. Rolling very, I like rolling very well. So, uh, but uh, I, I tell you, man, um, you know, it was, it was, it came down to understanding at that time who was going to be the best coach for me. Right. You know, I grew up in foster care, and you know, I needed discipline. I needed somebody to take the place of my high school coach. Right. Uh, they had a defensive mentality. Uh, he was a disciplinary and all that stuff. So, you know, it was a no brainer, but, uh, you know, I, I was leaning a lot towards Georgia tech. I had a great time in Atlanta on my visit and I loved Atlanta. Dennis Scott took me on my, on my, on my visit, man. We had a lot of fun, him and Brian Oliver. And uh, and then also, uh, I was loving Maryland. Man. Maryland was incredible. Bob Wade, I mean, he gave me an incredible pitch. And, you know, I thought that uh, that might be my future as well. So it came down to those two, those three, really, Georgia Tech and Maryland and then Georgetown. You know, so, but I think I made the right decision. Yeah. I, I think I made the right decision. God, Big John, God rest his soul. You know, he, uh, you know, played for the Boston Celtics, you know, played uh, and backed up one of the players that I have I befriended over the years. God rest his soul and somebody that I admired his play and, and then Bill Russell. And um, I had a chance to spend some quality time with him over the years, you know, and um, I think that his influence, you know, kind of helped drive my career even more and take the right approach, you know, toward, towards being successful uh, at the professional level. Yeah. I mean, what a role model, two good role models to pattern right. your game after. And, you know, everything else that they've done outside of basketball, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, definitely two guys yeah, very successful. Pioneers. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely pioneers, you know, great. Mm -hmm. Great humanitarians as well, you know, and um, I just it just kind of fit the mold of who I am, what I'm all about, and when the ball stopped bouncing for me, you know, it kind of transitioned into, you know, me utilizing this platform that basketball created for me uh, to to give back and make a difference. So, you know, I've been trying to do that, you know, not just as vice president of player development here and share my knowledge and influence with these younger guys is coming through these doors, you know, but here in the community, inner city kids, you know, growing up in the inner city and understanding all of the challenges and obstacles that I had to face, uh, uh, helping these young kids navigate through that, break down those barriers, you know, and, and still uh explore and value and embrace higher learning uh and becoming first generation scholars you know so that's that's something that i've I've taken a lot of pride in after uh after the ball stopped bouncing for me what was your relationship with like with big john like we we talked to Patrick about this and Ralph and some of the other guys you know what was your relationship like when you were playing and then after you were done right. playing at George yeah. It, it, it's the best analogy. You know, it was a father-son type relationship. I mean, he wasn't just like a coach player. No. It was basically father-son, you know. And uh, he treated us, he treated all of us like we were his, his children. 
You know, he disciplined us. I mean, he yeah. reprimanded us. You know, he taught us. The, the gymnasium, the reason why, I, heard, I mean, he got a lot of criticism for it. But, you know, the gymnasium, gymnasium was like his, his classroom. Yeah. You know, and he taught us more about life than he did about basketball. So, you know, you got to, you know, he received a lot of criticism because he wouldn't let media in during practices. He wanted an opportunity to teach men the way he wanted to teach men. Mm -hmm. And he didn't want to be dissected and criticized for the way he taught us. And I think he did an incredible job. You know, I really did, yeah. you know. And well, I, think that, I think that if we had an audience in the gym all the time, it would have kept him from doing his job and helping us. You know, so and he re received so much backlash for it. It was ridiculous, you know, but he was ahead of his time, though, in a lot of stuff. And he, I just think he was misunderstood by yeah. people outside the Hoya program. Right. Which which partly was on purpose. Right. He kept it tight. Yeah. Because that was the foundation of teamwork. Right. Was, yep. That was it. These are the bonds. And yeah. the, the, the father son that you're talking about. I mean, you you mentioned it. You know, you look in, you you wanted a little discipline, you you needed you needed some of that because of the, the you know where you grew I up. Needed. Right. I didn't I didn't need to be at Syracuse and uh, and running wild. I didn't need I didn't need that. <laughs> I didn't need right. that. Would have been good though. <laughs> hey man. Yeah. I did not need that, brother. I needed somebody right. to keep me on the straight and narrow. I mean, and then when the times that I got in trouble. I needed Big John to really reprimand me and get me back on track because I mean he he saved my career, he saved my life, man. I mean, so many different times, you know. I mean, I had, so let me ask you. So you're you had an association at the, that particular time, man, that could have destroyed my career. And if it wasn't for Big John, he saved my career and my life, you know. So So when you go there, they have Dikembe, right? Right, right, right. So talk about a little of that dynamic. I loved it. Made my job easier. <laughs> you know, hey, listen, I wish I had the kid made my whole career, you know, <laughs> my whole NBA career, my college career. I mean, the kid made, made life easy for me, you know. Uh, it gave me a chance to play power forward. We played together, yeah. man. And, yeah, well, it's funny because, yeah. Ralph Dalton spoke about that with Patrick as well, you know, when, when, they, when they arrive and they come in. Yeah. You know, it, it, you know, a lot of guys would be a, you know, a threat almost and a, d well, a no deterrent. Here, no, I get you. Hey, let me tell you what: if we had some guards, we would have won it all. I mean, we well, have. You got two. Wait, 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 wait. So wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. You, you're That's taking chucks too literally, man. This big. <laughs> don't be blaming the. I love what he's saying. Oh, don't yeah, don't interrupt the guest, honey. If we had Allen Iverson, <laughs> oh man. Oh. If we yeah. had AI with yeah. the two of them, with me and D, well, Ch we Ch would have won. Not fair. That we would have won. Here. That's we not won. Fair. Well, we made it to the Elite Eight. We yeah. almost made it to the Final Four. With, yeah, but yeah, AI. Charles Thomas Smith was the best guard I played with. Yeah, Charles was good. He was the best yes. guard. I yes. Yeah, he was. So, and that, was. so talk about that team for a second. That's your freshman year, right? Yeah, my freshman year, yeah. So now you wind up at the Brendan Byrne Arena against Duke in the Elite Eight. Uh, yeah, in New Jersey, it was in yep. Chicago. Yeah, in Jersey, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. So, Metal so, yeah. yep. Talk about that run and what what got how'd you guys get derailed there by those guys? Still bothering them. Look, what, man. Um, our, we we couldn't put the ball in the basket. We were struggling to do that. Uh, and they made some big shots, man. Danny yeah. Curry had an incredible game. You know, he was a he was a great college player. And then um, Christian Leitner, you know, a freshman, highly talented freshman, you know, behind me doing it in that class. And, you know, we were both McDonald's All-Americans, you know. It just, right. it just didn't pan out. Uh, Robert Bricky, for them, for Duke, you know, played extremely well in that game. And uh, I'm going to tell you, man, you know, they uh, they were very efficient offensively against us, you know, and we didn't have our best defensive game at, at, at all. I mean, they were very efficient offensively, you know, and they ended up pulling away. Um, 
I'm gonna tell you, you know, the game of that tournament was the first round game when we played against Princeton. So yeah, that almost kind of kind of took the wind out of our sails a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. Even though we won it, you know, it just it, it exposed our, our our vulnerabilities a little bit. It exposed us. Uh, but that was a game of the ages, man. They still play that game. Yeah. Uh, and they always I, – I, I tell you what, I've ran into people that have gone to Princeton and they said, man, you, you know – you know, was that block shot clean at the end? Did you did you foul him? I'm like, no, that did that was <laughs> blocked a lot of shots that game. Yeah. I did not foul him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah. no, that was an exciting game, you know. But by the time we got to the Elite Eight, we could have easily won that game. And I'm gonna tell you, Seton Hall, we had whipped up on them the whole year, and they ended up making it to the Final Four that yeah. year. They went Hall, to the finals, and, right, against Michigan. They played against Michigan. Yeah. 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 And they ended up beating Duke. Yeah. And seen all beat Duke. It was just crazy how it all worked out. You know, yep. we were better we knew we were a better team than Seton Hall. So sometimes you gotta get the bounces so, though, right? It would have been us in Michigan in, in the finals. That would have been yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned him early. I want to go back to that a minute. Tell me about the relationship that you have with the Kembe. Uh, and continue to have with the Kembe. I know you guys are real close. Extremely. How's his How's his health these days? How's he doing? Um, you know, and and well, what's what's your Kembe, what's the status of your relationship with him now? Well, well, first of all, you know, you know, the Kembe will forever be uh, a brother, and the reason why I say that is because him and I have we've traveled together, we shared dorm rooms together. I mean, we shared family experiences together. I mean, he will forever be family. He will forever be a brother, you know. Um, unfortunately, he's dealing with some health obstacles. Uh, yeah. And I know that he's a fighter and he's doing that. But uh, it's tough seeing him the way he is because we're accustomed to see him how he used to be. You know, um, yeah. Patrick and I went and visited him um, about three or four weeks ago. We went and visited him and spent some time with him for a day, you know, and it was just, we just try to lift his spirits when we see him. Uh, we know that he's progressing well, but it's it's just not fast enough for us, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it sucks when when life presents these type of obstacles and and we feel helpless because we can't do anything about it other than to show up and support them and hug them and love on them and, and just be there for them. You know, that's just keep that positivity, do. right, Zoe? I mean yeah, that's yeah, man. That's all we can do, man. Yeah. yeah that's all we can do. We've all we've all had loved ones and, and and people in our lives that have been involved with that kind of stuff. It's tough, mm -hmm. man. It's right. There's no yeah. easy way to say that. So um yeah. I appreciate you sharing that with us. Yep. I know that could be tough. So, yeah. Did, um, did Patrick, let me ask you one question about, because you mentioned you and Patrick. Did Patrick have anything to do with you coming to Georgetown? Was he was he a part of it? Like, did he make some calls and say? Of course he did. You know, I mean, I'm going to tell you a quick story. It's going to be quick. 82, Patrick was a freshman. They played against Carolina. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know the results of that. Know it well. Yep. Yeah. All right. You know, it's a very historic game. Patrick blocked a lot of shots. He goaltended a lot of shots. When I saw him goaltending those shots and blocking shots, I got excited because I wanted to do that. I wanted to be that. So right then and there, he became my favorite player. Outside of Dr. J growing up, you know, the, the red, white, and blue basketball I had when my father gave to me at age eight. Um, Watching Patrick's career gave Georgetown an edge. And when word got out to Big John that he knew that, you know, that uh, that I admire Patrick, at the Nike ABCD camp, 
I'm on the floor stretching with all the other players. And Patrick walks in to get Jim in Princeton. <laughs> Big John was already in the stands. So evidently he had called Patrick and told him to come. And Patrick, I, I kept looking in the stands. I was like, oh, I got to bring my A game. And I, like, yeah, we got, I got my guys in the stands. I got to bring my A game. So uh, I, I didn't see him coming. But Patrick came out of the stands while I was stretching and tapped me on the shoulder and introduced himself. Man, I melted, bro. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. So that was that was a moment for me as, as a high school player. It really was, you know. And uh, I proceeded to dominate that camp. I really did. <laughs> I dominated, I dominated Stanley Roberts, Sean Kemp, Billy Owens. I killed them all, man. You know, I knocked them, yeah. Blocking shots, everything, man. It was, it was, yeah, it was a motivating moment for me. It's great. Yeah. He motivates you even if you're playing against them, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, yeah. everybody gets amped up uh, to play the Georgetown Hoyers back then. That was yeah, like yeah, the game. Yeah, 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 man. I mean, we so, had, or, or, let me tell you what, there was a certain level of healthy fear, too, you know. Yeah. No that kidding. we totally lost that we lost all of that fear because teams used to they'd be like, oh, man, we got our work cut out for us tonight. You know, that was the reputation we had, you know, yeah. uh, because we were picking you up from end to end. The effort was there. The diving on the floor, the physicality was there, the elbows flying, you name it. I mean, it, that was our yeah. reputation. And I tried to uphold that. You know, when you I did a good out. job, Zoe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you That's and, you so and the they both check For that. Sure. You can check that box. Yeah, check that <laughs> box. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, you know, but but the long and short of it is, is that you know, the Big East back then was a conference where everybody admired. They really did, you know, and that that um. That piece they did with Dave Gavitt on, I think it was the 60, the 30 for 30 piece. Yeah, the Requiem for the um, Big East. Yeah, yeah, about how the the Big East launched ESPN. Yep. That blew me away. Yep. And I could see why, because, you know, the headquarters of ESPN being in Connecticut and them trying to really find their niche Mm -hmm. And they found it with basketball. That was a perfect storm. It was the perfect storm, man. And a lot of people don't know the genesis of all of that, man. Right. But let me tell you, boy, that was an incredible documentary piece that they did. And Dave Gavitt was, you know, he was the orchestrator of all of it. And then you had all of these Hall of Fame coaches, Connor Secker, Big John, you know. You had um, uh, 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 Massimino. I mean, the list goes hey, on. I'm, yeah, they were all. I mean, hey, a character, Patino. Hey, Patino. I mean, you you name it. We had them all, man, all these Hall yeah. of Fame coaches. And it just added a little bit more flair to the game of, of basketball, especially in the Northeast. So you had all of these households, man, Mm -hmm. Watching basketball, big Monday, baby, <laughs> big Monday. <laughs> yeah, and everybody watching big Monday, man. That was the day, man. Everybody was tuned in to watch two Big East teams get after it, big Monday. Well, Mike so Trangisi talks about the Big East. John, Big John calls and wants to talk to Dave Gavitt. Dave's in a meeting, not to bother him. He says, "Go get Dave." So he goes and gets him. Dave, you got to take this call. And John's on Big John's on the phone. We got Patrick, and then Gavit turns it and says, "Listen, we're going to Madison Square Garden. Book it." Yeah, that was another thing. Right, the Big East in Madison Square, Madison Square Garden was like no other. That was a destination. Right? Yes. Every... Talk so, about that for a second, Joe, so, because that that final weekend, that final four weekend was incredible, and we've we've talked about it many times. But I'd like to hear your perspective on that, on the electricity and what it was like. Uh it, it man, it was it was New York City, you know, considered the mecca of basketball. Yep. 
And having the Big East there, man, it was just the excitement and the energy in the garden, man. It was, and winning the Big East tournament, man, I mean, it was, it was almost like winning the national championship. Yeah. You know, because those were the toughest teams in the country. You know, uh, now it's the SEC. They've kind of taken the torch, you know, but yeah, man, back then, man, it was, it raised the hair on your back. Man. It really <laughs> did. And it brought out the best of me, man. I'm going to tell you, man, playing against Syracuse, you know, a pit. Uh, Providence playing against those teams, Seton Hall in the Big East, man, in the Big East tournament was, man, like no other. Great games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. Even BC. Yeah, yep. even BC yep. with Dana Burrows and everything, man, it was, yeah, it was uh, incredible. Yeah, you, it got it prepared you for the next level, you know? It I mean, oh, it sure did. It so really talk did. about that because now, now you go and you get drafted, yeah. right? And, uh, and you get picked up, um, and and with the Charlotte Hornets and yeah. talk about how the Big East prepped you for that for your pro career. Well, you know what? What prepped me for my pro career was playing against Patrick and Akeme during the summer. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> hey, listen, I couldn't have asked for a better scenario. I listen. Yeah. I every summer I had a chance to to bang with Patrick and Akeme, and then once I got good at it. I knew I was ready. I was like, I'm ready to play against anybody now. I mean, these are two Hall of Famers, seven footers. I'm undersized and I'm competing at this level with these guys. I was ready to go. So when I when I got drafted, it was plug and play for me. I was 20 and 10 immediately. I was 20, I was 20 and 10 in three blocks a game immediately yeah. because of the the seasoning that I had already and the experience that I had playing against those guys and the confidence that I built because I felt like, I mean, I played against, I mean, like, who is Rick Smith? Who is that? You know, right, right. who is this guy? Who is that guy? You know, I mean, I ran into Olajuwon and, and David Robinson. You know, I played against David Robinson when I was trying out for the Olympic team in, in uh, 1988. You know, so him and I were on the same team. We were on the Olympic Select team. I was practicing against David Robinson. You know, so I had all of this season, and man, I was ready to go. I could have left after my freshman year. The only reason why I didn't leave is because my foster mom, I made a promise to her that I would get my degree. She's a, re- right. she's a retired school teacher. She was a huge advocate of education. And I made a promise to her. I made a promise that I, I would get my degree, and I did. Um, I said, look, basketball, the NBA ain't going anywhere. It's gonna be there when I'm when I'm done with this. So mm-hmm. I, I I stayed all four years. You know, and it kind of speaks to, you know, it's it's, it's it kind of speaks to these kids kind of taking those four years for granted. You know, you know, the development that you receive those four years is priceless. So when you do go to the next level, I mean, we got a guy on our team now, you know, I mean, I can four years at UCLA and then I mean, look at him. I mean, he's an absolute young stud out there. I mean, should have been, I think if the draft were today, he'd be in the top five, you know? Yeah. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with, you know, him staying at UCLA, UCLA for four years. Uh, I think that has had some effect on his his comfort level yeah as and you can see it his poise and his comfort level when he's out there on the court uh so yeah we uh we definitely got a got a jewel in the draft for sure i want to ask you about when you moved to miami in in the nba and the miami heat culture because we've had other guests and they talk about it and to me, it's real. You can sense it. You can see the way they play. Right. There, there's continuity. Players staying on in development, in different positions. Yeah. They value loyalty and they're loyal back. You know, right. like you, you, you just hear it. So talk a little bit about what Miami meant to you moving in the NBA. And then what's so special about Miami? Well, What's so special about Miami, you know, is that um, it's uh, it's one one language that everybody speaks, mm-hmm. and we speak it profoundly. Okay, 
and nothing gets in the way of that particular dialogue that we speak around here. All right, and that dialogue was established by by Pat Riley and Mickey Erst. Right, mm-hmm. started from the top. Mm-hmm. So when everybody's speaking the same language, you're able to create a culture. Mm-hmm. You know, we have no hidden agendas at all, other than to see each other do well. All right, and to win championships. That's it. There's no other agenda whatsoever. You know, so we kind of keep the main thing, the main thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, we don't we don't stray away from that. And it goes from the marketing department to the media department. <laughs> Everybody's speaking the mm-hmm. same language, you know. And, and uh, I think the beauty of that is that, you know, once the players kind of settle in and understand, um, when they understand, when they come here and they, they understand it, they digest it and they understand it as well. That's when the magic happens, man. You know, it really does. You know, and you see it, you've seen it on the court for years. And we've got an incredible leader mm-hmm. uh, in Eric Spolster, yep. uh, who I think, you know, and obviously I'm a little biased, but I've heard from, from critics that, that he's the best coach in the league, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, he's proven that. He's proven that by the way he has orchestrated um, our play over the years, uh, especially when we were counted out and wasn't expected to be in the finals. And I mean, look at last year. I, mean, I think last year kind of speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. You know? And you know, I, 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 a lot of that has to do with our leadership, you know, our leadership. And then obviously the guys make a, making a, a serious commitment and in pre- preparation and, and, and going out there and doing their jobs. As, as a player, what was the first thing that struck you when, when, when you changed from your culture to that culture? Uh, well, you know, I just, Pat Riley and I sat on the floor when he brought me in, we were practicing at the Palmetto. It was an old fitness center that we, we didn't even have our practice facility back then. You know, we didn't even have it in a, we had an arena, but it was, uh-huh. older and you know and Pat shared his dream with me and, and he said look man he said I bought you here he said because you know I want to I want to parade on Biscayne Boulevard <laughs> <laughs> so, I love it that's yeah, perfect <laughs> yeah we sat on the floor out there it was just him and I on the floor after practice and he was explaining to me telling me about his life I was telling him about me and what I was about you know and that day I drank the Kool-Aid, man, you know, and, and from then on, <laughs> from then on, it's, it's, it's been, you know, eat, sleep, and breathe, you know, Miami Heat basketball and, and developing this culture that, you know, now the the sports world in general, not just basketball, I mean, I think everybody in sports, you know, is trying to understand how to create that type of atmosphere. 100%. It, it, whether it be football, baseball, basketball, hockey, 100%. Whatever, they yep. want to create that type of culture, yeah. that organization, you know, but uh, it, it starts with, it truly starts with one voice, one language, and everybody speaking the same thing without any hidden agendas. That's what it, yep. that's what it starts with. That's great. You can you feel know, it. I mean, it's, it's, it's palpable. Yeah. Sure. And, it, and it's getting tougher and tougher to do that, especially on the college level with the way things are today. I mean, Villanova had a great culture for a long, long time. They're still hanging on to it, but Jay's not the voice anymore over there. It's a little different now. So oh, well, you know, it, what was it like? What was it like at Georgetown? And compare that to Miami. Was it was it was it sim- and obviously it was similar? Obviously, there's differences it because it's professional and amateur. But when, when Big John there, there was a lot of similarities to Big John and Pat Riley. There was a whole lot of similarities. Yeah. And they actually spoke quite a bit, you know. Uh, they were very cordial and they spoke, you know. Uh, but, you know, the long and short of it is, is that, you know, they both were defensive-minded coaches that were, uh, that prioritized preparation. It was all about preparation, being overly ready. You know, Pat Riley would always say hard work doesn't guarantee you anything, but without it, you don't stand a chance. And um, so 
we overly prepared for competition, which made the game so much easier for us. And that was that way at Georgetown too. You know, we uh, our practices were long, they were intense, they were hard. But when we got in the game, the games were easy. Was I, was, I was looking forward to the game. I hated practice. I was looking <laughs> forward to the game because the game yeah. was so easy, you know. Yeah. So I got to change. I'm going to change subjects on you real quick. Okay. Talk to me about your Olympic experience. You know, as a high school kid, you were uh, coming in and you had an opportunity to try out for the Olympic team. And here you are, you come full circle yeah. and, and you, and you get the gold medal on a, on a real good team. You have, he's got yeah. a lot of talent on that team. Talk about that experience. Well, well, first of all, I, I tried out for the Olympic team in high school, okay? And it was a humbling experience, you know, because I came out of high school and I saw all these college players that I was, I was watching on TV and I'm like, good God, man, I gotta, I gotta play against these guys. And um, so what I did, oh, got a little ice machine over there. <laughs> And wait till this thing stops. It's loud too, man. We we can't hear it on this side, so it's good. Yeah, we can't hear you. You can't hear it? No. Oh, okay. All right. We'll go ahead and come to it. All right. So so anyway, you know, the long the, the long and short of it is competing against all of these college players. I was I was confident in my game, but I'm saying to myself, Jesus, you know, how, how am I going to navigate through this? Uh, and then once they put me out there and I started competing, when I went to Denver and uh, we were up at the Olympic Training Center and I started playing against all these guys, uh, I started realizing how good I was at that age, you know, <laughs> because I mean, my confidence went through the roof because I was I was beating these guys. These are college players, and I was just I was beating them. And uh, you know, my my endurance was better than theirs. You know, my athleticism was a lot better than theirs. You know, you know, so I kind of gained a lot of confidence. You know, which uh, during the whole process, you know, when I started making cut after cut after cut. So um, coach came to me. He said, look, you can probably make this team. He said, but I want you to go back to school. So obviously, you know, I was kind of disappointed because I should have been on that soul, that Olympic soul career uh, yeah. team. I should have been on that team, you know, but – there was a coach that was thinking about the best interest of the player, not about winning the gold medal. It wasn't even about that with Big John. It was about me getting to school, getting acclimated to the environment. It was about me getting accustomed to uh, going to class, orientation, collegiate environment, all of that stuff. I mean, it was, that's what it was about for him. And uh, but I'm going to tell you, Coach Ravlin, who was his assistant coach at the time. Yeah. Coach, coach, coach Ravlin, to this day, when I see Coach Ravlin, he looks at me, he's like, you know you should have been on that team. <laughs> he's like, I tried to talk him into it. Yeah. I tried to talk him into to keeping you on the team, you know. So, uh, but I didn't make it. I didn't make it, you know. But that kind of speaks to who Big John was. And then, and then you got it at the end. You got your gold medal, and you had the. Uh, yeah, man, I, I ended up, you know, you know, it, it me and Shag out. always talk about. First of all, me and Shag always talk about it, the debate. Should have been him or I on that dream team in 1992. You know, yeah. which one should have been? You don't have to say who should have been yeah, all. Yeah, you yeah, can, yeah. We already know. You don't have yeah, to say. We, it shouldn't have been Chris and me. Oh, been well, you said it anyway. There you go. <laughs> one, one, one of us two, you know. We know. 
Yeah, so <laughs> Zach ended up getting his gold medal. Yep. In uh, in in Atlanta. Yep. I missed that team, and I played in 2000, and I got my so. But I was also a part of Dream Team Two, the World Championships, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, that was the second team assembled with Isaiah, Joe Dumars. Uh, Reggie Miller was on that team, Mark Price, Derek Coleman, LJ, Shaq, myself. That's when we played over in, um, in Toronto. That was, that was a pretty special team to be a part of. So you're froze. Thank you guys are frozen. I'm good. Chuck's frozen. Oh, Chuck's frozen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he did this to me one other time. All right. So um coming back to it. So the uh, so so the the Olympics experience wraps. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let this be the last question, guys. You got it. All right. So final thoughts, last last comment, most memorable times, be it college or pro. Share it one or two experiences. Uh, I think the most memorable time in college had to be my Big East experience. You know, playing in the Big East tournaments, the level of competition in those games. Those experiences probably are, are experiences that I'll treasure for life. Um, I think the NBA is kind of self-explanatory. You know, when we won June 20th, 2006, when we won the world championship. Uh -huh. um, first in the franchise history. It took us 13 years to get there. You know, I'm going to tell you, man, you know, there was a lot of doubt that whole playoff process. Mm -hmm. so in the series, there were doubts. And, you know, we were against Chicago. We were down and you know, we ended up coming back and beating them, and then we were down 0-2 in the finals. You know, we just – you never know you're going to win a championship until you win it. Right. Until it actually happens. You know, you might look good on paper and everything, but you never know what's going to happen until it happens. You know, right. so that moment has got to be the most most memorable moment uh, at the professional level for me. Well, I can't well, thank you enough, Chuck. You want to wrap it? Let's wrap yeah, it. Yeah, Zo, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, you know, I we we I know you're you're tight on time. Rob's giving me the high sign, and I don't want to ruin that relationship that I've had with him for forty years. So we got to say goodnight to you and say thank you very very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Good we luck really tonight. Appreciate you, man. Thank, thank you. Man. Thank you, man. It was my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate All right, it. you All got right. it. You've been listening to and watching the Big East Rewind with Sonny Sparrow and Chuck Everson. The Big East Rewind is produced and directed by Nick Chico Chorus and Daryl Gurney. You can check us out on all things social media by putting Big East Rewind in the search bar. And we have a brand new hot off the presses. It's out now, a website where you can keep in touch with all things about the show. Uh, by subscribing to the website and you'll get notified on when our shows are dropping and everything like that. You won't miss a beat. And that is BigEastRewind.com. BigEastRewind.com. Thanks again for joining us. Everybody have a great night. Thanks. Appreciate you all. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks, Zoe.